Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today in the studio is Greg Lukianoff, an attorney and president of FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education. And on the phone is Jonathan Haidt, the Thomas Cooley Professor of Ethical Leadership at NYU Stern School of Business. Together, they are the co-authors of The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up a Generation for Failure. Welcome to Free Thoughts, gentlemen. Thanks for having us. Thanks. I'd like to start with the the odd pairing of a First Amendment lawyer and a psychologist <laughs> yeah. uh, end up writing a book together. So, so how did that happen? Um, well, uh, you know, to make a long story short, um, sometime around 2013, um, I noticed that uh, – the, uh, suddenly, um, students had always been the best constituency for free speech on campus, and I'd been working uh, at, at FIRE since 2001. And almost overnight, we saw um, students suddenly um, really opposing speakers and demanding new speech codes and demanding uh, trigger warning policies and microaggression policies. And it happened so quickly. I've talked to other friends like, who, are, uh, who are pundits and that kind of stuff. I'm like, what, what just happened? Like, what did we just get hit by? Because – um, you know, they'd always been so good about this. Uh, and the the thing that really made it distinct, though, was that their justification wasn't this is saying that this you know speaker here coming is offensive or bigoted or some other you know sort of uh, reason that, that that this is a despicable person. It was medicalized, um, and, and very suddenly people were arguing that it would be traumatic to have this person here. Um, hearing this, having this person would leave me feeling safe, possibly trigger me, lead to medical consequences. And I'm I'm kind of a psychology hobbyist. Like I, I like to read lots of books about it, but I also personally have benefited tremendously from cognitive behavioral therapy. And I was looking at this ideology that I've been thinking about for years and thinking, this isn't what a psychologist would say. They wouldn't say, you know, like, if you're afraid of something, by the way, hide from it as much as you can. Um, and so I, I went and talked to, to John about this. John and I be, had just uh, pretty recently become friends. We went to an Indian restaurant in, um, uh, in, in Greenwich Village, I think. And uh, I, I discussed the idea with him and to my surprise and delight because I'm a big fan of John's work, he said, um, yeah, let's write an article about it. Back in, And this was back in 2014. So you know, it's as simple as that. And John, you had you been thinking about from your field in psychology, it's something I've thought about too that's sort of not just in this student speech context, but the weaponization of psychological concepts to describe yourself when people casually say they have OCD or things like that. Is that something that you had been paying attention to, John? Well, it's unclear whether it's weaponization um, or whether it is uh, a change in their self-concept and, and that they really believed it. Um, so I had I had uh, just moved to NYU a couple of years before I, I spent my career 16 years teaching psychology at the University of Virginia. And only looking back on it now do I realize that all of my students at UVA were millennials. I taught the entire millennial generation. And when I moved to NYU, we thought the millennial generation was going to go on for a number of additional years. We thought millennials were those born up until 2000 or so. Uh, but around 2014, I began to see students reacting very strongly to um, to images, to words. I began hearing this new language of safety. So when Greg told me that summer, uh, summer 2014, about his idea, I thought it was really brilliant. I thought it was the only explanation I'd heard uh, for this uh, for this sudden change. And, and I look at it because I study morality. So I look on it as a, a new moral order. It's not it's not that some people are bad or are trying to do something nefarious. It's that there's a new way of looking at at people and relationships and and it's very confusing. It's confusing to people who are older than about 30. Um, so that's what we set out to understand. And uh, that's what we laid out in much greater detail in, in our book. And that's something I've noticed. I mean, not just in the OCD con, con like I, using OCD and things like this, but the use of the word trauma, yeah. it, it that's been kind of seemingly going up, it, not just starting in 2013 or something. I've heard people using the word trauma, like seeming to overuse it for quite a while. Th things are traumatizing to them that seems to be stretching of the definition. And you say that definition has stretched, correct? Well, that's right. So we, we draw heavily on a, an Australian psychologist, Nick Haslam, who wrote this really brilliant paper on concept creep. And he shows how concept, concepts in psychology have changed since the 1980s. Now, of course, words change, concepts change. But what's interesting, he notes, is that they only move in one direction, and that is downward. That is, they become um, uh, more and more permissive to allow more and more things in. And these are the concepts like bullying, addiction, trauma, uh, bigotry, 
Uh, there's a, a couple of others. So he notes that they move only down to take in more stuff. And then I wrote a commentary on the paper uh, in which I observed that they also move in one direction politically. That is, they only move to the left, uh, by which I mean they only move in ways that allow people on the left to make a stronger claim about whatever it is they're trying to do. So if, you're, if you imagine being a prosecutor in court um, and you want to say that America is a matrix of oppression or something like that, um, you would want to take in more and more victims. You'd want uh, uh, criteria to become weaker and weaker, but only for your side. So this is not necessarily something about the left versus right per se. Uh, my interpretation is that as universities have become more and more homogeneous politically, it could just as well have happened in institutions on the right. But as universities have become more and more homogeneous politically, um, some of our research has been pressed into service or, or drawn into service uh, to, to fight the broader culture war. And so establishing, so using mental health criteria uh, to fight political battles, I think, is partly what has happened. Now, if that's weaponization, well, I suppose I just made a case for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, and, you know, I was, a, like I said, I was a fan of John's work uh, <clears throat> before uh, meeting him, and Righteous Mind uh, is one of his uh, one of his great books. Don't forget the Happiness Hypothesis. Oh, that's, happy, that's also a great actually, one, Actually, Happiness <laughs> Hypothesis was even more why I, I sought John out. <laughs> Boys, I'm enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> Partially because it talks about meditation and CBT, things I, I really believe in. I just think it's a, it's a great book in general. Um, but also Righteous Mind, and he talks about how sort of, um, if you look at the political political spectrum, increasingly people on the left have, have almost a unipolar morality that's all about sort of the, 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 the care ethic, um, that essentially anything that you can say uh, that does harm to victims, um, that's all that matters. And without sort of a balancing out of other, other sort of moral foundations, it does – I think it partially explains why it would sort of uh, tear away from that. But it also has the added benefit of creating something that you know I've, I've called the perfect rhetorical fortress where essentially – um, I, we've used an awful lot of IQ points, an awful lot of cognitive energy on campuses, um, even back when I was there in, in, in the 90s, to figure out ways to not have to actually – to always win an argument by never getting to the argument. Because if you can argue um, things like – you can argue privilege. <laughs> I mean when I was in law school, it was easy enough just to say, oh, you're a conservative. I don't have to listen to you. And I, I, I'm, I feel ashamed that I, that was actually somewhat effective on me for a while. I didn't, it meant that I didn't read Thomas Sowell and Camille Paglia to much, to, to much later. But now we've got this incredibly Byzantine system of ideas like punching down and privilege and trauma um, that really more or less allow you to never actually talk to anyone you disagree with if you don't want to, or at least um, uh, disqualify them from having an opinion. Yeah. yeah let, let me just add on to that to say uh, that the, the use of those rhetorical strategies rather than addressing the argument is extremely important for understanding universities because those strategies make sense in the public square where it's one giant boxing match. And you don't really have to persuade your opponent. What you're trying to do is show off for your team, motivate your team. Uh, you're trying to inspire onlookers. But in universities, we've organized to do something very, very different. We're not there to do a giant you know, public relations campaign. We're, we're there to put people into dialogue with each other so that each one can contradict the confirmation bias of the other. As long as people are engaging in argument in good faith and really trying hard to find flaws in the argument, then the whole system works and it generates wisdom and where I should say knowledge and truth that we couldn't get at otherwise. But when a whole generation is learning to respond to arguments, not by picking them apart, but by discrediting the speaker, basically they're learning super advanced techniques of ad hominem argumentation. When that happens, it basically stops us from doing the work that we're here to do. Now, I went to Boulder in it's been about twenty years now, but but Boulder was that we had that first wave of discussion of political correctness on campus in the nineties, and I I started there in nineteen ninety nine, and and I took a bunch of literary criticism classes, and and I'd heard a bunch of these ideological concepts before they kind of broke into the mainstream here, and I regarded them as extremely dangerous, but somewhat confined within my postmodernist uh, deconstruction professors and things. But I did have professors in law school, for example, tell me that a uh, Marxist feminist professor that her quote she always used was, you can't fight an enemy that has outposts in your mind, which, which is her describing hegemony and the way words can sort of work into your brain. You always have the you can't fight the master's house, take down the master's house with the master's tools ideas, where they're basically saying that the words are getting into your head and so changing your thought that you're unable to think enlightened thoughts. 
And I told her one time that her line, um, you can't fight an enemy without posting your mind, was functionally not different than witchcraft. That people people <laughs> with, with words had put a spell on people. Right. Now, but that being said, if I believed that, uh, and that was the kind of harm, I would absolutely want to shut those speakers down for the same reason that religious people want to shut down heretics, right? I mean, is that really what, what was happening here on the ideological side? Oh, that, and that's been one of the fun things about working with John. At one point um, I, during writing the book, uh, when he talks about this ideology being very much like a religion, um, which definitely from his own work made, made a lot of sense to me, I, I asked John, like, are you saying that it's um, sort of like analogous to religion or virtually like, virtually coming from the same place? And, and he was like, well, Actually, it's really a lot of this really does seem to be taking the place of religion. Am I am I saying that correctly, John? <laughs> exactly. It's not an analogy. It's a homology. It's using the exact same psychological structures. So uh, a lot of my work, certainly in the Righteous Mind, was about how humans evolved as tribal creatures. Um, we broke out of our small, tiny groups by developing civilizations. When we do that. Our primitive traditional religiosity, which is about worshiping rocks and trees while dancing around campfires and painting awesome. bodies, that's what that's what, <laughs> Burning that's Man. what religion looks like. It looks very similar all around the world until groups take up agriculture, and then they develop larger gods that are punishing um, and moralistic. And so, uh, my argument in the Righteous Mind was: we have to understand how we evolved to create a moral order which revolves around sacred objects. This is our big trick. This is how we're able to cooperate in large groups that are not kin. Once you see that in religion, then you can take away the formal religion and you see the same stuff operating. So if you look at fraternity initiations, you know, I was once on the radio talking about the righteous mind and I said, I mean, it could be anything. It could be like a beer keg. And some guy calls in and says, well, actually, at my fraternity, we had the right of the beer keg. And we worship the beer keg. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very deep, primitive stuff. It's, it's stuff that makes me like Carl Jung, the idea of archetypes. Um, and so you see it in sports, you see it in politics. You can't understand group action or political action unless you understand religion. And there are more fundamentalist forms of religion that are quite toxic to those around and to those practicing it. And then there are much more benevolent forms of religion. So, you know, most sports doesn't lead to soccer hooliganism, but, you know, in Britain, somehow they've made it toxic and it does. Similarly, um, most student activism doesn't lead to toxic outcomes. But there is this new kind of student activism in which students get prestige precisely by calling other people out, mostly for word use. It, it mostly, most of the charges are about a single word, not even an argument. It's usually about a single word. I, I don't know usually, but very often about a single word. And so this is a kind of a, it's, a bla it's basically blasphemy. It's the psychology of blasphemy has been imported into universities, which is the last place on earth where we should have blasphemy laws. Yeah, and that that reminds me, um, to, uh, the 2015 article that we wrote in the Atlantic. Um, that was our first sort of foray into this. This is actually um, when we co-authored uh, an article also called "The Coddling of the American Mind" in the Atlantic, and we wrote it in the summer of of 2015. And I emphasize that or we finished it in the summer of 2015. Um, and I emphasize that because uh, later on, people actually thought we were writing it in response to the sort of Black Lives Matter protests um, that hit you know about 100 campuses um, in, in the fall of 2015. And you know, I'm a First Amendment lawyer. I, I, I'm, I'm the head of an organization that defends free speech rights and, and has had great fun defending the rights of students. But the thing that made the protests in 2015 feel like such a mixed bag was, on the one hand, students are overcoming apathy and they're and they're they're fighting for what they believe in and they're exercising their free speech. But in too many cases, for me at least, they were also demanding, uh, you know, new speech codes. They were demanding like the Wesleyan Argus be shut down for running a single article that was critical of Black Lives Matter. Uh, there was a whole Christakis thing, of course. And as we discuss in the book- That's a um, thing at Yale, correct? Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Um, that we discuss in the book is the very sad story of Dean Spellman. That was, was that Claremont McKenna, John? Yes, at Claremont, uh, at Claremont McKenna. McKenna. And what's so sad about that one is that it absolutely was someone trying to say something nice, someone trying to be compassionate, and maybe they used the wrong way of saying it, but really got treated very much like a blasphemer. Now, on that, on those examples that you give it throughout the book, uh, some people have wondered, and it's sort of an active discussion now, that, that you see East Coast schools often, liberal arts colleges, some higher level colleges like Yale, this happening there, uh, Berkeley, places where you might expect it. And those are very, very visible mm -hmm. 
and we might be having some sort of bias in, in thinking that it's more widespread than it actually is because we've seen some extremely high profile things. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have an idea of how widespread this actually is? I mean, if you go to say Mississippi State University or, or someplace in the South, or is you going to get as much of this stuff as you would in, in Yale? Yeah, we do have uh, we do have some some evidence on it, and um, so when we started talking about about this problem, um, Jeff Sachs, an econo uh, a political scientist in Canada, uh, wrote a, a tweet storm looking at data, challenging us, uh, and it was a very productive debate. And I think what came out of it is the recognition that America has 4,500 institutions of higher education. And so if you go to the great majority of them, you wouldn't see anything. They're not protests. Uh, you know, there, there's nobody shouting anybody down. In fact, uh, Sean Stevens, the research director at Heterox Academy, graphed out where the actual shout downs have taken place. And they're almost all in the Northeast and the coastal strip of the West Coast. In other words, they're only at progressive universities in very, uh, very left-leaning parts of the country. And this makes sense if you think about the social dynamics such that it, uh, there's, a, there's a, a strong consensus about the moral order and everybody's on one side and it seems obvious, it seems uh, uh, just objectively true uh, what is the right way to, to think and be. Um, so if you go to most universities, you wouldn't see anything happening in terms of shout downs. On the other hand, on the other hand, right now I'm in Cleveland. Uh, I just talked, uh, I spoke yesterday at Case Western Reserve, which is, uh, you know, it's a STEM based, it's a, it, mostly an, an engineering school is its background um, here in the Midwest. And they have not had any of these shout downs, but they are having all the same problems that schools all over the country are with rising anxiety and depression students increasingly unwilling to or having more difficulty um, with with challenges and confrontation. Um, so things seem pretty healthy here. They are they, they are having these trends and they're working on them. So we don't we, we really try in the book not to foment a moral panic, not to say students are losing their minds. A generation is lost. What we can say is that the mental health crisis, it is a crisis, especially for girls, is national. And that cuts across races and religions and to some extent social class. Um, but the dramatic stuff um, that we write about, the shout downs especially, that only happens at elite, mostly at elite schools um, in the Northeast and the West Coast and Chicago. Yeah. And um, one thing, uh, putting my fire hat on, but also pointing out the chap chapter where we talk about bureaucratization, corporatization of universities, um, even though some of the more uh, ideologically um, tinged, to say the least, uh, things tend to happen at, at a lot of these elite colleges and also school like Evergreen. I'm not really sure how you'd characterize Evergreen State University. Um, but uh, at other schools, you still have the time, the kind of challenges that fire has seen throughout our entire career, where it's just an administrator who might be afraid of a lawsuit or a regular regulation really clamping down. So the problems are, it's not as if we're saying that there's no problem at these other schools, uh, just it hasn't been as uh, as self-righteously um, ideologically driven. Now, we also recognize the possibility, though, that a lot of times that the, you know these, these concepts kind of drip down into the rest of the society. So it's, it, I'm curious to see what the next you know five years look like. Well, no, we're, we're actually seeing it happen already. Since the book has come out, I'm getting a lot of email from principals and uh, at high schools and parents of high schools, high school students, because they're seeing these same trends, the move towards describing words and ideas as safe versus dangerous. Um, the, the idea that kids should not be forced to do things that are unpleasant, uh, as there was the, the big brouhaha a week or two ago, some students uh, were where students around the country are asking that they not be required to do public speaking because some students uh, find that very anxiety provoking. So therefore, we should eliminate the requirement. Um, so it's creeping down into high schools and it's creeping out very quickly into the workplace, especially in companies that hire from these elite schools. So our book just got an Amazon review uh, two days ago, which I'd like to read. It's short. And it's very revealing. So somebody wrote, I couldn't understand why my new bright young workers kept running to HR for every little interpersonal problem and why they refused to refuse to show up to meetings with the person who they thought offended them. This book explains a lot about those recent bad hires. So I'm hearing this over and over again, that the people in their early 20s, they go into the corporate world, they overhear someone telling a joke, they see a, an image on someone's screen, somebody uses a word, it's often just a word, and they go right to HR. They don't talk to the person, they don't just ignore it, they go right to HR. 
And Greg, you're in your last book. Um, you you make the point which came out in, in unlearning learning unlearning unlearning liberty came yeah. out in 2013. I want to uh, say 2012. 2012, and you had expressed at that point that the, your biggest concern was what would happen to these students when they go out into the world, mm -hmm. right? And and if they come up with these illiberal ideas and then right. they move out into the world, but that was before yeah. the the new right onslaught of, of what you guys call iGen. So so what what is this? I mean, John mentioned it previously too, and you mentioned it the twenty thirteen and and there's a difference between millennials and this generation called iGen is is which is a a term you take from another author, I Gene think. Gene Twang, yeah. Yeah. What, what is, who, who are the iGen generation? iGen are people uh, born 1995 or after. Um, and it, it, it basically, Gene Twang is a, a generational expert. That's what her whole career has been looking at difference between generations. And she saw a really dramatic discontinuity between millennials and people born after 1995. And that's actually a really good way to figure out, you know, where generations starting to begin is by looking at surveys and all that, all that kind of stuff. Um, in her book, she uh, thinks that a lot of the, and we're, one thing that we found out that was you know really kind of horrifying in, in the early research for the book was that while we had kind of assumed that there was going to be um, an increase in anxiety and depression on campuses because like we argued in our original article we're teaching a generation the habits of anxious and depressed people so we shouldn't be we shouldn't be surprised <laughs> that they're anxious anxious and depressed but when the numbers finally came in and you know uh, when John looked at them they were much much worse yeah I, I just want to read this this is the the stat of the book that made me audibly yell out it, it, when I was reading it. Uh, a 2016 report by the Center for Collegiate Mental Health using data from 139 colleges found that by the 2015-2016 school year, half of all students surveyed reported having attended counseling for mental health concerns. That is shocking. Uh, and and would oh, you, I, did you oh, see that, that too, John? That's nothing. We can see much for shocking stats. <laughs> but, you, know, you know, because that could be just that um, just that this young generation is much more comfortable about talking about mental health. That's really a good thing. So there was an article in the New York Times two weeks ago by Richard Friedman, a psychiatrist, who said, don't worry, there's no anxiety epidemic. Screens aren't rotting your kids' brains. Uh, you know, here's the biggest survey done in 2012 shows no change. Well, yeah, in 2012, there was no change. And then he says, and, you know, there are a couple of surveys that uh, show that a recent increase, but those are just based on self-report and students are more comfortable talking about it. So it doesn't mean anything. Well, we thought about that long and hard. We looked really hard at the data because we didn't want to foment a moral panic. And the two pieces of evidence that really convinced us that this is real and serious are a study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that found it looked at hospital admissions. These are kids who are admitted to hospital for harming their bodies to the point where they had to be hospitalized. They weren't, it wasn't fatal and, and they often weren't, they usually were not suicide attempts, but it's, you know, cutting yourself and, uh, with sharp objects, things like that. Uh, and the rates are up, they're way, way up for uh, girls ages 10 to 14. They're up substantially for girls 15 to 19. They're not up for boys and they're not up for girls over 20. So it is unique to um, iGen, to the basically to the kids who were teenagers when social media came out, or when they when they largely got on it around 2010, 2011, 2012 is when there's the big uptake. So it, hospital admissions for self harm are way up, and that is not self report. And most alarmingly, suicide is up, and that's for both sexes. So uh, if you look at the last two years of data. Uh, uh, for boys and girls, uh, teenage boys and girls, what we find is that the rate for boys is up 25 percent uh, from the average of the first decade of this century, the average 20, 2001 to 2010, 25 percent up for boys. That is huge. The increase for girls is 70 percent, seven zero. So this is not an illusion of self-report. This is a, a tidal wave of anxiety and depression leading to self-harm, hospital admissions and suicide. So and uh, so one of the causal uh, – uh, so we talk about six causal, causal threads um, and we talk about anxiety and depression. But in two distinct chapters, one on polarization, which we also think is part of the reason why all of this is sped up. We think polarization, particularly echo chambers, really speed speed this up and reward tribalistic behavior. But social media does play a role in both speeding up polarization but also um, for depression and anxiety. And we agree with Twangy that, that the, the numbers are quite convincing that there's a correlation there. Just 
just the coral, but it just doesn't explain enough of the variants for um, uh, depression uh, and anxiety. That which is why we do actually assume that excessive social media use, particularly for these sort of social comparison websites, can be very harmful to you know particularly young people's um, uh, happiness. And the way I put it for people who, who look at me skeptically when I say this, I, I say. Imagine being in uh, the worst aspects of junior high school, twenty four hours a day, forever. <laughs> does that does that sound nice to anybody? So those yeah, are you can't, you can't even get away on weekends when you're home with your parents, or, or and people don't get uh, you know they're still on their s smartphones at two o'clock in the morning too, which doesn't which doesn't help. So those are the first two causal threads. Do you want to talk about the other ones, John? Yeah, sure. Just wait, before we get off this, I just um, Lenore Scanese, the, who wrote Free Range Kids, she just sent me an amazing stat this morning from a, a survey just published in the UK. Because the UK is just about six months or a year behind us. Um, they're having the same events on campus. I thought the time difference was uh, more like six hours. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, they're they're having the same uh, issues of rising anxiety and depression among teenagers and especially girls. So here's a, a survey found uh, finds sharp decline in happiness of young women and girls. And nestled within all the statistics is this. Um, in other ways, however, girls' lives appear to have contracted as their world moves online. In 2009, 69% of girls met friends at each other's houses, compared with 21% in 2018. So think about that. You know, in junior high school or early high school, you'd go over to a friend's house, you'd go play. They don't do that anymore. They, most of them do not, after school, they see each other at school. When they go home, they sit in their room and they're on social media. So imagine what this does to developing social skills. Imagine what this does in a world that is getting physically safer and safer, but kids are immersed more and more in an online world where anonymous people can make threats that are never acted on as far as I know, but are scary. So this is a big part of the problem. And so we talked to the six uh, ways of leading up to this. We're kind of going backwards here, but I think it works is we'll get to the three untruths. But w if we set the stage with here's a generation and here's what happened to them, and then we bring them into college and we'll, we'll get to that. But so we have uh, anxiety, depression, parenting practices and play. Would you like to talk about that, John? Sure. Um, so, the, so the main thing we're trying to explain is this rapid change in 2014 that Greg noticed and that became really, really clear in the year or two after we published the Atlantic article. Why do things change so quickly? And we identify six causes. Um, and so two of them are about changes in parenting. So one is paranoid parenting. That is the idea that um, uh, so until the idea that if you the world's dangerous for kids and if my kids are ever outside without me or another designated adult watching them, they will be kidnapped. Or at least there's a, such a high risk of being, them being kidnapped that it is worth me not letting them out. It is worth me depriving them of freedom um, to, to remove this microscopic chance that they will be kidnapped. And this happened because of cable TV. There were a few highly publicized uh, uh, killings of of, of of young children, Aton Pates and then Adam Walsh especially. Um, so in the 80s, that kind of gears up. But it's not until the 90s that uh, that kids seem to have been, uh, that, that the new idea came out that if you let your kids walk to school or play in a park, you're a negligent parent. And it's not until the early 2000s that we hear the first reports of parents being arrested because their kids were caught playing in a park unsupervised. So the change in childhood um, comes in gradually uh, in the in the 1990s. Kids learn of stranger danger. The world is threatening, uh, and so sure they're they're more afraid now. That's part of it. Uh, so that's the paranoid parenting. Related to that is the loss of free play. And this we think this was the most interesting and exciting thing that we learned that was new to us. Yeah, it was a really fun chapter to write. Um, it's that ma well mammals play. We all know that. Um, I was walking through Washington Square Park the other day in New York City, and I was walking by the playground where all the toddlers played. It was really cute to see them running around and screaming and rolling and tumbling and laughing. And then, and then 50, you know, 100 yards further on, there's the small dog playground. And it was really cute to see the small dogs <laughs> running and tumbling and rolling and playing and laughing. And you, know, um, and you really get, you really see, wow, this is what mammals need to do. This is what young mammals need to do. They need to wrestle and play and run and test each other. Um, mammals practice chasing games, play, uh, tag to prepare for either being prey or predators. So in all kinds of ways, play builds the mind. The, the human brain is designed to be completed long, long after birth, and play is what completes that wiring. Well, what happened in America, and also the UK, it turns out, um, as we got more paranoid, we didn't let our kids out, and then we also went insane for early academics. We got this ridiculous idea 
that uh, if our kids listen to Mozart, they'll be smarter. If our kids learn fractions in first grade, they'll be smarter than if they wait till third grade. Let's push everything earlier. Let's see, what should we kick out? Well, recess and art, we don't need those things. They won't help you get into college. So the loss of play, uh, we believe, is one of the biggest reasons why kids who are play deprived find interpersonal conflicts very, very hard to resolve. They don't have the skills, so they run to HR and then they refuse to come to the meeting where they have to face <laughs> the person who made a joke. Yeah, and I, I love how you cite, cite Steve Horowitz, who's a friend and has been on Free Thoughts before to talk about some of these things, and especially the difference between formal and informal play mm -hmm. and how it helps to – you can – create a basketball game or something. And this is what I did. And I imagine this is what Greg and John, you guys did too. You get a, a bunch of kids of different ages playing a game that's unstructured without anyone supervising. It's not Little League. It's a pickup oh, baseball sure, yeah. game, right? And you have to figure out how to adjust because there's a six-year-old playing with some 10-year-olds. Uh -huh. and, and you work on a way to, to work them into the game, you know, and make sure. And that's all organic. And, and that's really, really good. And you can't run to, I mean, sometimes you'll, someone will run home to mom, which is a, a kind of what John was saying about HR, because that's the old saying, right? Yeah. Why don't you run home to mom and tell mommy? It's and a bad a, thing. And you know? that's a rule you violation. You learn not to do it. You and, learn to work it out. And yeah. now, and now it seems to be what they're doing uh, a, a lot more. Well, one of the things for, for me from a personal standpoint well, um, that was really interesting, actually, the, the, cha the, parent, the, the chapters on parenting were two, I think, for both of us, two of our favorite chapters to, to research and read, partially because it was an opportunity for both to learn things that we didn't necessarily know going in. And partially, since neither of us are parenting experts. We uh, interviewed our friend Lenore Skenazy. We interviewed Erica Christakis and Julie Lethcott Hames, who wrote a book called How to Raise an Adult. And the thing that really stuck in my head was, um, you know, Erica Christakis' work is pr practically screaming, kids need unstructured time, period. They need more of it. They need more unsupervised play and really hitting you over the head with how how well established this is and this uh, and i i have a i have a 9 month old and i have a, th uh, a nearly 3 year old and so i live you know i live on the hill where the, the, it's definitely sort of a bastion of of, of sort of agro parents and I'm like, wow, this is if this is really what 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 we're saying, um, and and what the research actually says. No parent I know is actually they're doing the exact opposite of of all of this stuff, which was really uh, uh, really profound to me. So when I try to explain it to like, other parents, like in the in the preschool group, they're like, oh, okay, yeah, we need more uh, unsupervised time. But uh, so how do I help them uh, you, you know, do that? I'm like, no, no, that's not that's exactly the opposite of what we're saying, and it just isn't sticking. Schedule two hours of unsupervised time yeah. between this period and this period. Go forth and be fun. Highly moderated by parents, of course. <laughs> no, but actually, but actually, that would be fine if they scheduled it. And it was called recess. Right. Sure. The playground True. monitor was inside. So yeah. if someone gets hurt, you know where to go. Yeah. But you know, at my kids' school, when my kids go to New York City public schools, and there's a playground monitor who's right there. No running. Someone could get hurt. No running. If anyone cries. He comes over. And and so what kids are learning is called moral dependency. If there's a conflict, they learn to be dependent. You have to go to the authority to work it out. And so this is the, exactly the opposite of how you would train young people for college, for democracy, or for employment. Yeah. Now, so you have – let's put these causes together, parenting, paranoid parenting, play, polarization, lack of play, mm -hmm. uh, polarization, overly biased – Professors, a university uh, that that's a contributing factor too. I think John is that you kind of touched on that, and it seems to work into the religious example I made, where one of the things about a religion that makes them look for heretics is that they're quite convinced of how right they are. Oh right? yeah, Plymouth Colony. Everyone in Plymouth Colony were pretty convinced that they were correct yeah. uh, because they lived in a very homogeneous ideological framework. Agnostics generally as a rule don't burn at the stake, not agnostics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, right. That's right. So if we take seriously uh, all the things we say about diversity, about how being exposed to diverse people and diverse viewpoints helps us think better because it challenges our confirmation bias. If we take that seriously – you know, I think we have to see uh, viewpoint diversity among the faculty as beneficial. Um, now, the data on whether faculty, uh, you know, corrupt or indoctrinate students is, is unclear. There's not clear evidence that that if you have a liberal faculty, it's going to turn the students into liberals or vice versa. Um, young people are more influenced by their peers than by than by adults when it comes to what they believe. But on the other hand. Um, you know, like with the story of the princess and the pea, if a princess has never slept on a bed that was anything less than perfectly soft and smooth, a pea becomes intolerable. And similarly, 
if you're a student at a school who has never encountered a conservative or conservative idea, a conservative uh, uh, challenge to, to what you believe from one of your professors, and then, you know, Ben Shapiro comes to campus or some, you know, some conservative uh, or, you know, some conservative professor. Um, they're not so much protests over professors, but if someone comes to your campus who's espousing ideas that you have not encountered, it can be much more, well, I'll say painful um, if you've never encountered them. So I think political diversity among the faculty is very beneficial to having a healthy uh, a healthy intellectual climate. And as Greg said, it, it, it's, you know, it, it, agnostics don't burn witches. Um, if everybody is on one side, if there's political purity, you're just much more likely to have these ex the kind of extreme stories that we document in the book. Yeah, it really it, uh, it becomes an environment that really rewards the true believer. Well, how much do you think that the backlash to this is I have said that if you go onto a campus and this obviously varies about in which department you're in and you have some of the numbers in the book and you and you want to ask a question like um, what if there are gender differences between men and women? And there are some places where you're not allowed to even also ask, some classes, let's say, where you're not allowed to ask that question or you would feel very uncomfortable. It might make you upset. I mean, just if you're like, why can't we talk about things? And it might push you to more extreme thinkers who are provocateurs like Milo and Ben Shapiro and these conservative superstars who get a lot of credit for, quote, owning the libs is like the term, right? And, 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 and they're not being pushed. You know, we'd like them to come to reasonable Cato products, you know, where we say because we're not out there just pushing buttons. But they might just get so mad that they can't talk about things that they just look for the person who talks about it in your face as much as possible. And that's that's not good either because they're getting a poison, often a poisonous version of, of those ide ideas. Well, let's bring us back to our, our causal link of what we call the polarization uh, cycle that sometimes I even call the polarization spiral because I think it gets so out of control sometimes. My overall belief is that um, due to factors like the ability – like uh, um, social media and also the ability to sort of increasingly uh, – cities get decentralized and people can move to counties that quote unquote better reflect their values um, that that even – like let's say higher education didn't exist. I think we would be more polarized today than we were 30 years ago no matter what. But higher education is the, a unique institution that should actually be able to make us more sophisticated, more open to the possibility we might be wrong, more uh, accepting of uh, an understanding of people coming from different points of view. So it's, it's an institution that has this tremendous potential to actually um, uh, ease and calm some amount of the polarization. But tragically, I think it's actually speeding it up. Now, do you, we, we can we start – we go out to the beginning here with um, uh, the, th the three untruths. So, so after you have put iGen in particular through uh, uh, some pretty – dodgy uh, parenting practices, likely more things like this, you take them to college and they learn three untruths, which is how you begin the book. Uh, the first one is the untruth of fragility. Who would like to talk about that? Oh, I'd, I'd like to take that one because that's... Uh... That's, that is comes straight out of my first book, The Happiness Hypothesis, in which uh, chapter four is on the uses of adversity. It opens with the quote, uh, what, uh, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. That's Nietzsche. But it is a, it's a great truth uh, because it's, it's something that people have observed in all cultures. I have a great quote from Mencius. Um, when heaven is about to confer a great responsibility on any man, it will exercise his mind with suffering, subject his sinews and bones to hard work, et cetera, et cetera, uh, so as to stimulate his mind, harden his nature, and improve wherever he is incompetent. So what the sages, East and West, understood is that um, humans learn from experience. We have to have a lot of negative experiences in order to grow strong. Uh, and if we deprive kids of those experiences, we weaken them. And so we go through the example of peanut allergies. The reason that peanut allergies have tripled, uh, the rate of them has tripled between the 1990s and, and the present time, is precisely because we started protecting kids from exposure to peanuts, when in fact their immune system needed that exposure. Uh, we're doing the same thing with risk. We've made our playground safer. We've made everything so safe. We don't give our kids the experiences they need to develop normal human resilience and toughness. So that's why, since it's, again, it's not the kid's fault. We have overprotected them. Then they come to college, and all those unpleasant moments that we all had in college, they become not unpleasant moments that you learn to get over or tolerate. They become reasons to go to a dean or file a complaint. And and that includes the idea of, of microaggressions, which, correct me if I'm wrong, John, like it, mo most people who are trauma counselors 
would never tell you that the way you get over trauma, and Greg alluded to this earlier, is to hide yourself in a corner. Like if you came back from a war and fireworks give you PTSD, there's there's ways of of dealing with that to acculturate yourself to loud noises, but they've gone for the exact opposite and that seems destructive. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the issue of trigger warnings. And that is, uh, we talked to a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists about that. And they all agree that the way you get over fears and phobias is by systematic desensitization. Uh, you know, if you have a spider phobia, we're not going to throw a spider at you, but we're going to maybe write the word spider on a piece of paper and have you look at it. And if we're going to protect you from the word spider, well, your phobia is going to just stay the same forever. Or in large. It's only you, you, yes. ba basically, you can go from having an, a, a fear of actual spiders to a state where this this actually becomes so much part of your schema, so much part of your self identity that you're actually expanding the world of things you're terrified in rather than shrinking it. <laughs> yeah, uh, the untruth of emotional reasoning. That's me. Um, the uh, <laughs> the untruth of, of emotional reasoning is the one most closely tied to the original article that we wrote in 2015, uh, because emotional reasoning is actually cognitive distortion. Um, and we, we tie a lot of this to CBT. This all comes from my personal experience of battling depression and really uh, finding CBT to be this uh, not just wonderfully effective way of doing it, but with this deep sort of philosophical re re um, resonance because it has aspects of Buddhism in it and it has mo most directly aspects of sort of stoic philosophy in it. And what we were uh, – what I was seeing on campus um, in, in the original article was um, th th that it was a constant sort of statement of emotional states rather than argument. And you know, the most basic one, of course, is that I'm offended means something has to be done. And in, in CBT, you learn that every time you feel something, you shouldn't just greet it uncritically. It, uh, so th there's a great quote by Susan David. Um, she really boiled this down very well. Emotions are information, not instructions. Um, you can learn tremendously from why you feel jealous or why you feel angry. Um, but a lot of times what, what it's actually telling you about the situation you're in is much different than your your instincts make it make it feel like, and the emotional uh, the emotional reasoning. Um, we talk uh, a, a lot about how this can lead to distorted thinking um, and how this uh, manifests as distorted thinking. But we talk about this, for example, in the uh, context of microaggressions, which you brought up earlier. Now, I always feel like I have to say microaggressions as a topic, I think is a wonderfully interesting um, academic topic that people should study because we do slight each other in unintentional ways. But teaching of what uh, once you put this into a policy, it starts looking really ridiculous because you have you know UC policies saying anyone uh, qualified. I think the most qualified person should get the job. I think America is a land of opportunity. That's what it looks like when you operationalize it by administrators. But even just the practice of microaggressions of actually looking uh, for to, to try to find out how someone slighted you, and it doesn't matter what their intent is, is practically guaranteeing that people engage in distorted thinking. And it, and it makes uh, – and if you really want a diverse society from people from different countries, from different class backgrounds, from different regions, from different ages communicating with each other, uh, the only way you can do that and not being a complete mess is have a principle of charity, that you try to figure out where someone's coming from, not just the way their words make you feel in the least charitable light that you can paint them. But unfortunately, um, if you train people to really be hypersensitive to microaggressions, you you're also dooming that person to constantly feel like they're in, they're in a horrible state of, of, of surrounded by evil people when it actually might be more closer to a uh, a, a group of well-meaning people who are just sometimes have faux pas or, or, or communicate differently. That's right. So if we simply told told students coming in. We're going to have a lot of misunderstandings here. Diversity is hard. We have to work on it. Um, there are going to be a lot of faux pas. People are going to make a lot of mistakes. Um, let's try to make fewer of them. Here are some things that you shouldn't say or things you shouldn't do. So if we call them faux pas and if we reserve the word microaggression for things that are truly very small acts of aggression, then there wouldn't be this problem. But it's as Greg said, it's once you get this new doctrine that it's in impact that matters, not intent. You're opening the gates of hell. You're basically telling people, go with your feelings. If you feel offended, you were attacked. And by the way, here are a lot of ways that you can now feel offended by phrases that you didn't know were offensive when you arrived. I really like the principle of charity, uh, which is in the cognitive behavioral therapy stuff, which is which is incredible stuff and extremely effective from what I understand. I mean, you personally, Greg, of course, but you can see the studies about its effectiveness. But the principle of charity is is what we're often missing. It goes into polarization and stuff. I've been accused in my job here of being so charitable to my opponents that I should just actually realize that some of them are disingenuous hacks is what one of my, my former colleagues said. You uh, are motivated by <laughs> evil. <laughs> exactly. And that, and that gets us into the, the third one, the untruth of us versus them. Uh, which is the sort of Manichaean struggle that a lot of people think that yeah. they're involved in. Yeah, I'll take I'll take that one because that's so close to the righteous mind. 
Um, so, so much of my work has been on how um, we are by nature tribal and prone to post hoc reasoning in the service of our social and political goals. Uh, and so that's what you see in the public square. That's what, uh, there are a lot of reasons why polarization and uh, cross-partisan hostility have been going up and up and up in American society since the 1980s or 1990s. So with that as the context for university life, um, when students come in, uh, it would be very easy to play up the tribalism or turn it down. And obviously what we should be trying to do if we're trying to create diverse societies that are inclusive and welcoming is turn it down and encourage people to treat each other as individuals, to not be prejudiced against groups. It, um, that's basic social psychology, that's basic common sense, uh, that that's what we should be doing if we want this diversity uh, project to work, if we want diversity to be beneficial. But in some parts, it's not, it doesn't happen at all schools, certainly, but um, often students are trained in intersectionality. Now, intersectionality, you know, the idea that people's identities are at the intersections of many different uh, issues and axes, you know, race, gender, sexual orientation, class, etc., the idea itself is, is perfectly good. Um, in, uh, all sorts of things interact in, in the social sciences and in, in the human mind. Um, but the way it is actually taught, it encourages students to look around and to make very quick judgments of other people, to judge their level of privilege. You can judge by their skin color. You can judge by their sex. You can judge uh, by how they speak. Uh, and these judgments are not just what category you're in. They're moral judgments because oppressors are bad and victims are good. And so if we are encouraging students to make quick judgments of others, moral judgments of others, based on their group membership, and then we put them together and expect them to create a diverse, welcoming, open environment, there's no way that can work. So we should be, in so many ways, what we should be doing on college campuses, I think, is the opposite of what we do. We, we have a real challenge to create welcoming and inclusive environments. There's an enormous payoff. As Greg said, we are the premier institution that should be exposing people to diversity and, and uh, teaching them, giving them the chance uh, to, to, to find it to be beneficial and, and exciting, um, and prepare people for life in a divided democracy. There's so much we could be doing, but in part because we have bad ideas circulating uh, that give us policies that are almost never backed by evidence. So many of the policies we use in socializing students and running orientation, so much of the diversity training is not backed by any evidence that it does anything good. Um, but it's done in part for good intent and in part because, how did you say it, these people are you know, badly motivated? No, that's not true. But it's done for, I think, with an ideological agenda in part. And that ends up harming the very students that we're trying to help. Let's end it by telling people where they can go if they're concerned about this problem. First, buy two copies of The Coddling of the American Mind, one for you and one for the principal of your kid's school or the president of your university or whatever. Um, if, if the leaders of educational institutions get copies of the book, along with the message, what are you doing about this problem? What are, well, or what are, no, no, let me change that, that's moral dependency. What can we do about this problem? Um, then I think things will begin to change. Um, parents should all go to letgrow.org. It's a group started by Lenore Skenazy uh, and me and Peter Gray um, and Daniel Shookman um, to, to help parents organize and find ways to give their kids more independence. Uh, Greg, what, where else should people go for information? Uh, they should go to thefire.org um, to, to look at things that universities can do to, um, uh, uh, to, to fight for free speech on campus. I mean, to get rid of their speech codes, to have orientations that explain freedom of speech, and what to do when professors and students actually get in trouble for what they say. And Heterodox Academy to help figure out how to teach both sides of an issue. That's right. At Heterodox Academy, we have all kinds of resources that, that universities can use uh, to create a, an environment in which people can engage with those who differ from them. So we have a lot of essays, a lot of resources uh, for improving institutions of education. Thanks for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please rate and review us on iTunes. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.